Bring up the Word of God. It's a, it's a special thing. Stand with me if you would. Let's turn to Proverbs chapter number 4. Proverbs chapter number 4. And I want to look at one verse here in Proverbs 4, and I'll ask you to take your other hand, turn to Matthew chapter number 15, Proverbs chapter 4, and Matthew chapter number 15. People all the time talk about uh, going out into the world to find themselves. And you don't have to go out in the world to find yourself. If you're saved, your identity should be found in Jesus Christ. Uh, But I will tell you, it it is an interesting thing to study the matter of the heart. I heard a preacher one time say that the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. And uh, the man that taught me the Bible said the most important thing in your life is your personal fellowship with Jesus Christ. And that stuck with me. Proverbs chapter number 4, look at verse number 23. The Bible says here, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Matthew chapter number 15. Matthew chapter 15, and here what you have is you have a a situation where the Pharisees, Uh, have a problem with something that the disciples are doing or not doing, rather, and uh, they're not washing their hands. Amen? Every mom in here relates to this story. You know, they see their kids go, ah, ah, wash your hands first, you know. Uh, But you moms aren't doing it because you expect your children is going to somehow become spiritually clean through the exercise. You just don't want them putting germs all over them, right? Uh, But the Pharisees, their problem was they saw that this physical act was somehow going to make people more spiritual. And it didn't. And Jesus Christ addresses this, look if you would, at verse number 7. I mean, people talk about the... I've heard people say all the time, you know, I just love the teachings of Jesus. Uh, I wonder sometimes if they've read everything that Jesus said. Uh, Look if you would here at verse number 7. Ye hypocrites. I mean, imagine me starting off a message that way. Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And he called the multitude, and said unto them, Hear and understand, not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth a man. A man. Then came his disciples and said to him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? Uh, I don't think the Lord needed to know that, that the Pharisees didn't like. I think he knew that very well. But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Let them alone. Again, a classic example of something that if a man just said this on his own, uh, you would find him to be a rude speaker. Look what Jesus says. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Then answered Peter and said to him, Declare unto us this parable. Peter makes the same mistake that Bible scholars make today. They try to analogize. They try to say that the Bible, what what it really means is this. And the Lord is going, look at verse 16. Are ye also yet without understanding? It was not a parable. I spoke plainly to you. There was no symbology here. And he goes on to say this in verse 17. Do not ye yet understand that whatsoever entereth in at the mouth goeth in the belly, and is cast out into the draught. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the what? Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, Blasphemies, these are the things which defile a man. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you. It's precious to us, Lord. We don't want to take it for granted. Lord, thank you for air conditioning. Thank you for nice, soft chairs to sit on. Lord, thank you for a nice, clean building. Lord, thank you for this space. Thank you, Lord, for a church family to gather with. Lord, thank you that there are people that see that it's 
it's not just an obligation. It's important. It is a value to still wake up on a Sunday morning, grab that book, and come to church and get together with your people. Lord, bless those that came today. Lord, I pray you'd fill their cup. Lord, I pray you'd speak to them. Lord, anoint me with the Spirit of God from on high. Help me to preach with boldness, with clarity, with power. Lord, I pray that you'd help us as we explore our hearts, that you'd show us exactly what's there this morning. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Be seated if you would. Now, I know it's not very flattering, but there in Matthew 15, you know what you have there in verse 19? You have a list of things that are found in your heart. When you look down in your heart, you say, no, 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 my heart is pure. Let me say this right now. If your heart is clean this morning, it is only because of the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit in your life because you accepted Christ as your Savior. Apart from God, your heart is not pure. And here in this list, what you come to grips with is, this is who I am without God. Over there in the book of Revelation, Jesus Christ, uh, there you have seven churches that are listed, and there are seven literal churches in church history there in Asia Minor, which is like Turkey today. And of those seven churches, you get to each one, and each one is a, a literal historical church that existed, none of which exists today, by the way. You can go and see where the place where they once were, and they're just gone. Most of those places now are, are, are following the religion of Islam. Those churches once were a light, and the light has been snuffed out. And as you look at those seven churches that were literal churches, you also see there a picture of things in church history. You come to that last one. That last one's name is Laodicea, the rights of the people. And what you learn in Revelation chapter 3 is that Jesus Christ is standing at the door and knocking. You say, what does that mean? He's on the outside of the church trying to get in. I thought church was about him. Not anymore, it's not. It's about what programs you have. What are you going to do for me? Do I like it? Is it comfortable? Uh, do you, does it have an age group that I can mesh with? Uh, it, it, does it have this benefit? It's all about people. Let me say this. Every compromise that has ever happened in church has always been presented with this. We have to do this to reach the people. Am I right about that? Now listen, I want to reach people. But I don't ever want to find us because of the hardness of our hearts with Jesus Christ on the outside knocking trying to get into this church. Can you imagine going to your home and finding that the locks have been changed? And going, somebody going, that happened to me once? <laughs> Got in a real bad fight with my spouse, came home, everything was gone. <laughs> Can you imagine that though? And you come there and you're going, wait, my key's not working, I can't. Hey, I mean, there's been times where I come home, God bless my family. And I come home, and I've got, you know, groceries or whatever, and I'm, I'm, the, I'm the pack mule. I'm the only man in the house. There's no son. I'm the pack mule. And I come, and I've got all this stuff on me, and I'm going, hello, ringing the doorbell, knocking the door. Hello, hello. And I'm just begging someone, let me in. <laughs> Look, gee, that's funny, but Jesus Christ being on the outside of a church, there's no humor in that. Why is that? Why is he on the outside looking in? Because of the hearts of his people. I want to bring you a message today entitled, The Matter of the Heart. And I think it's important to understand if a couple things up front. Number one, the definition of your heart. What exactly are, is it that we're talking about? Your heart can't be kept clean. It can't be kept right. It cannot be kept with all diligence if you don't even know what it is. You know, it's like whenever I'm talking to a mechanic and they're talking about, you know, the, the, uh, the transducer or the, you know, alternator doing this and the belt doing this. And they're, they're talking in terms I don't understand. I don't understand at all. And they know I don't understand, which is why they keep talking that way. So they go, it's going to cost you $5,000. <laughs> I heard a preacher one time say, you pay for what you don't know. <laughs> and that's the truth. I don't like coming to a church and someone speaking in ambiguous terms. I like knowing exactly what something is. I'd like to return the favor for you this morning. When we talk about the heart, we're not talking about the organ that beats and, and, and sends blood pumping through the rest of your body. So the life of the flesh is in the blood. No doubt, life is connected with the heart physically, but also spiritually. When we talk about the definition of your heart, we need to look at its location Look at Matthew chapter number 12. Here's some Bible study for you as we open this message up. Matthew chapter number 12. 
Matthew chapter 12. And as you turn to Matthew chapter 12, let me read for you Exodus 15, verse 8. And with the blast of thy nostrils, the waters were gathered together. Talking about God uh, bringing the Red Sea apart. The flood stood upright as an heap, and the depths were congealed in the heart of the sea. Where is that? In the depths of the sea. Look, if you would, at Matthew chapter 12. The heart is the center. It's the place that is, is the deepest. It's at the center of whatever it is that you're talking about. There in Exodus 15, it's the sea. Here in Matthew chapter 12, it's the earth. Verse 40. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the what? heart of the earth. What's he talking about? There in Abraham's bosom where paradise was, Jesus Christ went to the center, went to the heart of the earth and preached to the souls that were in prison and led captivity captive, Ephesians chapter 4. That's the center of the earth. That's the heart of the earth. When we talk about your heart, we're talking about what's that the center of your being. We're not just talking about the organ that's beating that blood the rest of your body. We're talking about something that's a lot deeper than that. And as we saw in Matthew 15, out of that heart, that's where the evil thoughts and the adulteries and the murders and the fornications and the thefts and the false witnesses and the blasphemies come from. The word heart is used in Scripture as the most comprehensive term for the authentic person. It is a part of our being where we desire, deliberate, and decide. It's been described as the place of conscious and decisive spiritual activity. The comprehensive term for a person as a whole, his feelings, desires, passions, thoughts, understanding, and will, the center of that, person, of that person, the place to which God turns when he wants to know who you are. That's your heart. You say, what's the function of my heart? It's the center of your thoughts. If, if we're talking about Jesus Christ going to the heart of the earth, the center of the earth, and we're talking about your heart, the center of who you are, what is the function of this heart? You know what Proverbs 23 says? For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. You know what the function of your heart is? It is to think. You say, well, I thought that was the mind. There is something deeper than just the organic brain that science can understand. It is the center of who you are, and it is the place where your thoughts are formed and, 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 and maneuvered and manipulated in that heart. Watch your thoughts, they become words. Amen. Watch your words, they become actions. Watch your actions, they become habits. Watch your habits, they become character. Watch your character, it becomes your destiny. That heart is the center of thought. That heart is the center of speech. Look at Psalm chapter 14. Psalm chapter 14. Do you ever find yourself talking to yourself? Don't worry, you're not crazy. I mean, you don't even realize it. When you're going down the road and you're going through your mind, in your, in your heart, you're thinking about your day, and you're saying, I'm going to do this, then I'm going to do this, do you understand how you process that? You process that in words. And you are speaking, so to speak, to yourself from your heart. The Bible says in Psalm 14, in verse number 1, The fool has said where? Not in his brain. The problem with an atheist is not an intellectual problem. It's a heart problem. The problem with you today, if you have a problem with God, if there's an issue, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. If there's an issue, the problem is not an intellectual issue. You cannot resolve it with education alone. May I remind you that World War II, when the Nazis did what they did, Germany was 98.5% literate. Far beyond where Americans are today. Can I say that? That was 70 years ago. Smart people. Smart did not translate into a moral equivalence. Do you understand that? It's a matter of the heart. It is not a matter of intellect. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. That is where you speak before it ever comes out of your mouth. You speak in your heart. The Bible says there are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord, that shall stand. You know what you'll do sometimes? You'll toy with an idea. And then that idea becomes a play in your mind. 
and you start rolling out the scenarios. And if I do this, and this will happen. And you'll dream about things you have no business dreaming about. Where does it happen in your heart? And you'll dwell on things you have no business dwelling on. Where does it happen in your heart? And you'll play that thing out through your, through your heart, and you'll, you'll picture this thing, and you'll say, I want that, and I want that so bad. And that thought that started off as just a little seed, it grows into a root, and before you know it, that thing is dictating what you actually live out in your life. That heart is the center of affections. Can I say this? Just because your heart is set on something doesn't mean that once you get it, you're going to be happy. Many a marriage has been ruined because someone's evil, wicked thoughts in their heart. Many a relationship has been broken because of wicked thinking in the heart. Many a church has been split because of someone's thoughts in their heart. And what starts off with you just thinking to yourself, I, I'd like that. I shouldn't think about that, but I like it. And you come back to it, you know, and then you think about not only do I like it, but if I wanted to get it, how would I do it? And then you go, no, I shouldn't think that way. I shouldn't think that way. Then you go back to, okay, if I wanted to get it, how would I get it? Can I do that right now? Then you go back, no, I shouldn't think that way. I shouldn't be dwelling on that. The Holy Spirit of God is speaking to your heart. And you go back and say, okay, I'd like that, and here's why I like that. And, and if, I, if I could get it, how could I do it right now? And by the way, I'm going to find a way to justify it to anyone that challenges my decision. You say, what is that? That's your heart. You say, why? Because it's the center of affections. Can I remind you that after Amnon forced his sister Tamar, after all that whole thing was done, he wouldn't look at her, and he told her to get out. He wanted it so badly, didn't he? He realized it wasn't what he thought. And he ruined lives in the process, including his own and his sister's and his family's and his father's kingdom. You say, why? Because of the center of affections. You know what the Bible says? Set your affections on things above. You say, why? Because naturally speaking, it doesn't work that way. Thank God that you're saved. If you're saved this morning, the Holy Spirit can speak to you and can speak to your heart. But understand, your heart is still wicked. I'm not going to parse words here. It is wicked. Understand that. It is deceitful above all things. And let me go a step further. Desperately wicked. That is your heart and that is mine. And just because you got saved doesn't mean it's all fixed. And there are some things, let me say this as well, there are some thoughts and some dwellings and some places you've gone to in your heart 20, 30 years ago before you're saved and you're still struggling with those things right now. Am I right? Why? Because your heart's that way. It's the center of your affections. And unless you make a conscious decision to understand that's what it is, I need to take that heart and I need to set it on Jesus Christ. I need to take that heart and set it on the Word of God. I need to take that heart and set it on things above and not on things of the earth. Naturally, it doesn't go that way. Your heart can be affected for Jesus Christ if you'll allow it. The definition of your heart, you say, what is it? It's the center. It's the center of who you are. Let's look at the condition of your heart. And let me say this as we open this part up. Regardless of what a psychologist says, pop culture says, doctor whatever, you know, whoever, regardless of all of that, you know what matters today? What does God say? All the time, people, Christians, ask themselves questions. What am I going to do here? I don't know. Did you, read, did you ask God to show you from the Word of God? What should I do about this? What does God's Word say? Hey, listen, my kids have questions. Say, hey, what does the Bible say? You say, why? I want them to understand. It doesn't even matter just what dad thinks. What matters is what does God say? What about the condition of your heart? Look at Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah 17. You shouldn't care what any other person thinks. You should care what God thinks. And as you turn to Jeremiah 17, I, 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 I read this to you. R.C. Sproul once said, it is fashionable in some academic circles to exercise scholarly criticism of the Bible. In so doing, scholars place themselves above the Bible and seek to correct it. Amen. If indeed the Bible is the Word of God, nothing could be more arrogant. That's the truth. 
It is God who corrects us. We don't correct him. And when you want to get a picture of your heart, you don't go to some commentary. You don't go to the Christian bookstore and see what some other person wrote about it. You ought to start right here. Jeremiah 17, look if you would at verse number 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The answer to who can know it's found in verse 10. I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Now, I understand that it is probably a verse, if you've been saved and you've been in church for a long time, that you've heard more than once. But I'm, I'm going to challenge you a little bit this morning. When you hear that verse, here's what people, here's what I think I've done before. The heart is deceitful above all things. Yes, the human heart is deceitful above all things. Man's heart is deceitful above all things. But you know what's really hard to do to come to grips with? To look at that verse of Scripture and go, Adrian's heart is deceitful above all things. And you look at that verse and you say, man, that's my heart. The worst advice you could ever give somebody is follow your heart. You say, why? It'll lie to you every time. Your heart is not in line with God's naturally. It takes a supernatural act of yielding to the Spirit of God in your life to get your heart lined up with God's. The condition of your heart, let me say this first off, it's unknown to you. You say, no, it's not. It's right there. Well, look at the end of verse number 9. Who can know it? <laughs> you hear what the Lord is saying? I'm telling you what is in your heart, and yet you don't believe it. I'm telling you what's there, but you really don't know it like I do. Can I say this? Nobody knows you better than the Lord. Hey, look, look, there's some things even from your spouse that you might try to hide and cover in your heart, but God sees it, and God knows it. You say, what is it? It's unknown to us. I read about uh, Adolf Eichmann, who was uh, one of the commandants of one of these uh, prison camps, I think in Poland during World War II. And during Adolf Eichmann's trial, by the way, he actually fled to Argentina like a lot of the Nazis did. And uh, he lived there for about 15 years or so in hiding. In 1960, they found him living under the alias Ricardo Clement, the Israeli Secret Service, and they brought him back to Jerusalem, and they put him on trial for the war atrocities, the war crimes against the Jewish people that he had a part in. And when Adolf Eichmann was on trial, I, I, I read this story about a Jewish man that went because they opened it up to the public, and this Jewish man was there, and he's listening to the trial, and as it's going on, he starts bursting out into tears. And one of the reporters turns to him and says, you, were, you, were, you suffered at this man's hand? He goes, no. Well, you must be angry right now. He said, no. He said, it isn't anger. He said, the longer I sit here, the more I realize I have a heart like his. You say, no, I would never do that. You don't understand the depths and the depravity of your heart if you can say that honestly. Amen. Peter says, I'll never deny you. He denies him. This is not an exception in human character. I work with a bunch of 20-somethings, and I understand it's harder for them to have a reference point as far as life goes. I made a comment once. I said, things are really not getting better in our society. They go, what do you mean? <laughs> they think it's getting better. I think anyone above 30 would understand it is not getting better. You know what? I remember hearing stories about people leaving their doors unlocked at night. Anybody here like that when you were a kid? Leave the doors unlocked, go out and play in the streets. It's not getting better. And yet they look at society and they go, oh, no, no, look at all the technology and all these things. Yeah, technology just gets more people connected together so they get more of their wicked heart out there in public so everybody else can dwell on what they've been thinking about. That's all it's done. And you know what man thinks? Man thinks, I'm not that bad. My heart is not that bad. Yes, it is. And this morning, I'm going to tell you right now, the Bible says, keep thy heart. We read it. Keep thy heart with all diligence. You're not going to keep it if you don't even see what the problem is. It, listen, and can I say this? When, when a preacher gets up and says these kinds of things, it is not for your destruction. It is for your help. 
is because when a person gets up, looks, and if I go to a doctor and he says to me, hey, you are just fine, everything's great, you've never been healthier, and I've got cancer and I kick the bucket in a year, I'm going to be mad at that guy. If you come to church to get help from God and the preacher says, you're fine, you're wonderful, you're beautiful, you're amazing, you're just the best, and the whole time he's flattering you and you leave and your life doesn't change and your heart continues going in the wrong direction and you find yourself further from God and out of that book and out of fellowship with Jesus Christ, that preacher's a bum. You say it's deceitful, that heart. Yep. Yep. Matter of fact, it says there, the heart is deceitful above all things. You know, there is one person in the Bible that your heart naturally is aligned to. You're not going to like this, but it's true. The Bible says of Satan, he was a murderer from the beginning and abode not the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of himself. He calls him the father of lies in John 8, 44. Your heart does not naturally incline itself to God's. Your heart naturally is inclined to falsehood. You have to be redirected by the Word of God and by the Spirit of God. Your heart will tell you, I have to have it. No, you don't. And you look at a donut for breakfast and you go, I gotta have it. <laughs> and after eating that donut and it's sitting there like it's weighing 50 pounds, you're going, I shouldn't have eaten that. <laughs> but your heart told you you had to have it. I have to look. No, you don't. I have to listen. No, you don't. I need it. No, you don't. When your heart lies to you and says it's good for you and the Word of God says it's not, when your heart says it's okay to do it because after all, these people are doing it and they go to church, remind your heart that it's wrong. <laughs> when your heart says, in so many words, God doesn't know what He's talking about, I'm not that bad off. You need to tell your heart to quit lying to you. The heart is desperately wicked. You learn that pretty early on with kids. I'm going to give you the property laws of a toddler. You ready? Number one, if I like it, it's mine. <laughs> Number two, if it's in my hand, it's mine. If I can take it from you, it's mine. If I had a little while ago, it's mine. If it's mine, it must never appear to be yours in any way. Number six, if I'm doing or building something, all the pieces are mine. If it, looks like, uh, if it looks just like mine, then it's mine. If I saw it first, it's mine. If you're playing with something and you put it down, it automatically becomes mine. <laughs> Here's the last one. If it's broken, it's yours. <laughs> you say, what is that? That's your heart. Listen, you can separate yourself from the world and from technology, from the outward fascinations of our society, and you can't escape the depths of the evils of your heart without God. You don't have a shot without Him. I'm trying to get you to see your heart is not just wicked. Pay attention to the adjectives in the Bible. It's desperately wicked. There are times in your life where you will deny the truth you know something's not right. You know it's going to be for your destruction. And you will convince yourself that it's going to be just fine because your heart is leading you. I mean, guys, think about this. Within the first book of the Bible, you know what you have? You have a lady listening to Satan, a couple hiding from God. You've got a man killing his brother. You got evil so bad, God drowns out the whole world. Not only does God destroy the world with a flood, then he has to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah with fire. You've got uh, uh, Abraham and Isaac lying about who their spouses are. You've got a messed up family situation because of impa impatience, which is what brings us today to the situation in the Middle East with Hagar. You've got selling a brother into slavery. You have a woman trying to seduce an innocent man with Potiphar's wife. You say, what's that? That's in one book. That's the first book of the Bible. You ever think about that? You say, what is the problem? I want you to consider those descriptors, those adjectives, when it comes to your heart. I want you to compare it to the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. He who is faithful and true. He who is holy, the righteous one. 
You've probably heard uh, S.R. Lockridge preach, That's my king. <laughs> That's my king. He's the miracle of the age. He's the superlative of everything good that you choose to call him. Will you allow me to praise my God for just a little bit? Can I break away from talking about how de desperately wicked we are and maybe talk about the Lord for just a second? I'd like to do that. He's the only one able to supply all of your needs simultaneously. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleanses the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the aged. He rewards the diligent. And he beautifies the meek. Do you know him? That's my king. My king is the key of knowledge. He's the wellspring of wisdom. He's the doorway of deliverance. He's the pathway of peace. He's the roadway of righteousness. I'm about to get some African American in here if you don't, if you don't help me out. <laughs> He's the highway of holiness. He's the gateway of glory. He's the master of the mighty. He's the captain of the conquerors. He's the head of the heroes. He's the leader of the legislators. He's the overseer of the overcomers. He's the governor of governors. He's the prince of princes, the king of kings, the lord of lords. That's my king. He's always been and he always will be. I'm talking about he had no predecessor. Mm. <laughs> And he'll have no successor. There was nobody before him. There'll be nobody after him. You can't impeach him. And he's not going to resign. That's my king. Praise the Lord. That's my king. Th thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. The glory is all his. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever and ever. And when you get through with all the forevers, then amen. <laughs> now, I like talking about that. <laughs> Now, when you think about that and you compare that to your heart, they're not even close. Compare the description, God's description, not mine, not a preacher's, God's description of your heart this morning to the life of Jesus Christ. You understand the condition of your heart, you understand the manipulation of your heart. Can I say this? Your heart is affected by things externally. Through your sight. You know what Lamentation says? Mine eye affecteth mine heart. I'm going to give you some statistics this morning. Here's some on television. The number of minutes per week that the average child watches TV, 1,480. Parents, the TV is not your child's babysitter. Amen, preacher. That's good. You know what Americans have done? They let other people raise their kids. They let a TV raise their child. And then they wonder, why do you talk that way? I would never say that. I don't know where they get this from. Maybe it's from who's raising them. The percentage of four to six-year-olds who, when asked to choose between TV and spending time with their fathers, prefer television, 54%. The hours per year the average American youth spends in school is 900. The hours per year the average American youth spends watching TV, 1,200. We haven't even gotten to social media yet, guys. You understand, you used to have to physically come home and sit down in front of something to get media thrown in your face. Not anymore. Everywhere you go, there's a phone in your hand, and you can just, bam, with the touch of a button, have a bunch of filth thrown right in your face. The Bible says, mine eye affecteth mine heart. You don't think, listen, there are things that some of you watch on a, mov on a movie that if I said from the pulpit, you'd never have me in this church again. Right. Amen. Amen. And you don't think twice about it. And you don't think it's affecting you. Yeah, it is. Here's what I found. The Christian that comes to church and gets offended with preaching, but doesn't get offended with the Hollywood taking God's name in vain, and saying GD this, and saying blankety blank this, and blankety blank that. And I mean, come on guys, would you ever let someone come in here and start making out in front of the church? You'll watch it on TV. You won't think twice. And you don't think it affects your heart? Yes, it does. God's people are so callous to sin, and so callous to what's going on. They come to church, and they sit there like a bump on a log saying, Bless me, preacher, if you can. I'm tired. I made it to a church, but I'm tired. I'm barely here. I don't even know that I want to be here. Give me something good. And you spend six hours a week in front of a TV, and you go, man, I just don't have time to read my Bible. No, you don't make time to read your Bible. When someone tells me, I don't have time to read, how much time are you spending on TV? Mine eye affecteth my heart. It's real quiet. 
The number of violent acts seen on TV by age 18, 150,000. Imagine the hypocrisy of Hollywood saying they want to disarm the American people. And all they put in front of the kids is... <laughs> Uh, ah, ah. You know, it's, it's this and make it this and mwah. And they tell the kids, no, you have to learn to behave. And you put all that filth in front of them and expect them to behave, they're not going to do it. Your heart is affected by what you see. What about the new media? The Journal of Pediatrics, not a Bible thumping preacher, okay? The Journal of Pediatrics says the average eight year old child spends eight hours a day on some form of media. A teen typically spends about 11 hours of their day on some form of media. In 2011, 36% of teens had a smartphone. In 2014, three years later, it grew to 79%. I liked having to come home and dial 3929309. See, whose number was that in high school was her number. <laughs> There was no texting. I know I'm sounding old now. You had to go home and make a phone call. Amen? Now it's just right there. Can I ask you a question, honestly, parents? Does the teenager really need to have all that at their exposure? You're putting, listen, some, some parents would never let their kid shoot a gun. Even with the proper education and training. No, no, stay away, stay away, stay away. But they'll give them a smartphone where they have access to X-rated filth, and the parents don't know what's going on, I'm telling you, I'm researching this stuff, and our young people are getting destroyed with the junk out there because of what's on their smartphones. It is not helping them. And listen, the idea of everything having to be digital is not always necessarily a good thing. More than 58% of children surveyed between 14 and 17 reported having seen Pornographic images on internet, on their cell phone. Fifty per I know it's not comfortable to talk about this stuff, but you need to understand what's out there so you can stay away from it. 50% of teens aged 3 to 18 frequently communicate with uh, someone online they've never met in person. That's dangerous, man. You say, what is that? Mine eye affecteth my heart. What's in front of you? This breaks my heart reading this. 51% of pastors say that some of that content, you know what I'm talking about, is a temptation. Of the 1,351 pastors that went to this website, this particular website, 54% said they had viewed some of that junk within the last year. Pastors. Pastors. And we wonder why our churches are falling apart. We wonder why our families are falling apart. Hey, listen, what are you putting in front of your eyes? It's going to manipulate your heart. It's going to change your heart. Let me ask you this. What are you listening to? The manipulation of your heart through your sight, but also through your hearing. You know what the Bible says about Absalom? He stole the hearts of the men of Israel. What did he do? He told them they were wonderful. He told them they were great. He told them, man, if I was king, I would listen. To, I would take all your recommendations, and I would listen to all of you because you're all so smart, and you're all so wonderful. But, man, that King David, he doesn't have time for you. He flattered them. What are you listening to? Now, listen, praise the Lord, you're in church Sunday morning. The other six days of the week, what are you listening to? Are you listening to something that's going to tickle your ear and tell you what you want to think and how you want to feel? Or are you exposing yourself to truth? Can I say this? For those of you that spend more than 30 minutes in your car a day, it would not be a bad idea to turn on Final Fight Bible Radio and get some preaching down into your heart. Get some of that junk and some of that filthiness out of there. You say, why? Because so much vanity and pride and conceit is boiled up in your heart by just listening to what you want to hear. You know what, the manipulation of your heart is evidenced by your manipulation of other people. Think about this. Delilah with Samson. Remember that? Oh, Samson, it, you don't love me. Because if you really love me, you tell me. You see, what's she doing? Manipulating. Why? Because her heart is manipulated. 
You know what some of you will do? You'll manipulate your spouse. You'll manipulate kids. You'll manipulate other church members. You'll manipulate anybody and anything in your path to get what you want if you're not careful. You say, Pastor, you're talking. How dare you talk? I'm just telling you, that's human nature. <laughs> you have to understand that about you. Your heart, when it's manipulated and turned against God, it will do things. It will cause you to do things that defy Christian living. And you'll go out of your way to, do, to get whatever you want. Think about this. When Delilah got what she wanted from Samson, you never read about her again in the book of Judges. You say, why? Because she got what she wanted. You know what I would ask the Christian that gets what they want when they're following their heart? Is it worth it? How about this one? I'm always concerned, by the way, when a politician is saying they're looking out for the poor. Because usually they're not. Judas was that politician. You guys remember this? And there, when that woman breaks that box of ointment and pours it out on his feet, you know what, Judas, instead of looking at it from the heart of God, looking at it from the Lord's perspective and seeing this great sacrifice this woman brought, you know what he says? He says it because he'd been thinking this way for a long time. Why was this waste of the ointment made? You say, what is that? That's a manipulated heart right there. And you know what he says? Oh, we could have sold it and given it to the poor. And you know what he did? He made her feel guilty for doing something right for God. That is the epitome of manipulation, guys. You say, what was the problem? His own heart was manipulated. Judas isn't the only one in human history that's been down that road. Is your heart manipulated this morning? Turning a certain way against what God's Word says in in the area of your life? Wanting something that you know is not what God wants for you, and you're justifying it, and you'll twist Scripture, and you'll make other people around you feel guilty because they don't see it like you see it, and you'll manipulate and manipulate and manipulate until you get what you want. You say, what is that? Jezebel. Ahab comes to her and says, I can't, I'm just having a real bad day, honey. Oh, what's wrong, honey? Why don't you tell me what's going on? Well, Naboth won't sell me his vineyard. I'll get it for you, baby. Listen, listen. She didn't care about Ahab. She hated that guy. Ahab was a pawn in her chess game. And whenever Naboth is knocked off, you read about the end of Jezebel's life, and it is not pretty. You say, what is that? A manipulated heart. I'm going to say something. Some of you ladies will manipulate your husbands from following the Lord like you ought to. Some of you men will manipulate your families and your spouses at times to get what you want, and it's holding your family back from seeking the Lord. You know, I've learned this a long time ago. If I walk up to a guy and say, God loves you, you know what the modern guy's going to say? So? You say, why? Because he doesn't know the bad news. He doesn't understand where he's at. He doesn't understand the predicament of where he's at. Am I right about that? He doesn't understand that he's a lost sinner on his way to hell under the wrath of God. He abides in the wrath of God, and, and he's a step, there's a step between him and death. He doesn't get that. So when I walk up to him and say, congratulations, God loves you, he goes, so what? The good news of the gospel doesn't really seem that good until you understand the bad news. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You know what the good news is this morning? Your heart can be purified. Look at Psalm chapter 51. Aren't you thankful for that? Psalm 51. Watch that manipulative spirit. Watch that manipulation in your heart. Because when you allow your heart to be manipulated, you will manipulate those around you you'll, you'll seek to. And it will destroy the lives of those around you. And I'm warning you because if you don't understand that that's where your heart's at, you'll never get to a place where your heart is clean. You know, your heart doesn't have to stay dirty. You understand that? David's a great example of that. Look at Psalm chapter 51. Look at verse number 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit 
within me. Can I say this? Number one, it is possible to have a clean heart. It can be done. You say how? Look at verse 7. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Boy, there is nothing. There is nothing like coming up on a wall with a bunch of smudges and taking a, a, one of those Mr. Clean pads. You know, the eraser. All the ladies are going, yeah. All the guys are going, Ugh, you know. And you take that thing and you start wiping that thing. I know some of you guys are thinking, how come you knew about it, Pastor? Very clean guy, I guess. I don't know. And you take that thing and you rub it. Man, it's just clean. It's like it's never been touched before. Yesterday, Brother James, he, got, he had his little uh, sliding chair, and I can pick on him because he's not here. And he had his little sliding chair, and he put the tape up, and he was meticulously going line by line, making sure that everything was covered, and it was white. You say, why? That white looks pretty bright against that brown wall, doesn't it? You say, why? Contrast. And that white is so clean compared to that. Man, it's beautiful. It just pops, doesn't it? It's nice. Against the filth of this world, you know what will stand out? Someone that's got a heart that's been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. That'll stand out. It is possible. Can I say this? Look at verse 11. It's urgent. Cast me not away from thy presence. Thank God I don't have to pray the latter part of verse 11. The Holy Spirit is with me until the rapture. Thank God for that. You ought to say amen to that. But I'll tell you what you see there from David's prayer. There, there is an urgency. David doesn't care about what everybody says. He doesn't care about what everybody thinks when he comes to church. Because you know what? You can come to church. Everything looks fine on the outside. No one would know any different. I'm okay. You're okay. It doesn't really matter all that much. But the fact that God can see in my heart and see that this morning I've got bitterness, got pride, covetousness, filthy dreaming, wicked thinking, manipulative spirit in my heart. All that going on. The fact that God can see it. Lord, create in me a clean heart, he says. Lord, cast me not away from thy presence. I need to be in fellowship with Jesus Christ. Verse 10. It's a matter of God's creation. You can't make a clean heart. <laughs> Can, an un, can a clean thing come out of an unclean thing? It says in Job. Listen, you can't make your heart clean, but God can. God can. I'm convinced that some Christians have just been living a, I don't know how else to say it, just going through the motions type of Christian life, but they don't realize that their heart has been hardened and is filled with the dirt of this world and the way that this world looks at things and, and filled with the things that you read about in Matthew chapter 15. Adultery and fornication and uncleanness and blasphemies and false witnesses. Do you understand, without God, there's something inside of all of us that likes to hear about everybody else's dirt. You say, why? Because if I see how dirty they are, I feel more clean. Can I say this? If you line yourself next to Jesus Christ... You know, we all need to be saying this morning, Lord created me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit with me. David connected the fact that his heart wasn't clean with the fact that his spirit had been troubled and been touched and had been defiled with the things of this life. You want your heart pure this morning? It can be. Or you can let it become hardened. I've heard it said, if you live in a graveyard too long, you stop crying when someone dies. That's the truth. You get overly exposed to the things of this world and the way this world looks at them, and you'll look around and go, I don't have a problem. Yeah, you do. The Lord can purify your heart. At the beginning of this message, we saw Proverbs chapter 4, where it says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. How do you keep something? How do you preserve that thing? You know what the Bible is full of paradoxes? The first shall be last. The servant of all is the chiefest of all. You know how you keep your heart with all diligence? You take it and you give it away. 
but not just anybody. You know what Proverbs chapter 23 says? Go there with me and we'll close with this thought. Jim Elliott said, A man is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Proverbs chapter 23. Proverbs 23, look at verse 26. My son, give me thine heart. You know how you keep your heart with all diligence? Take it, and you give it to the Lord. And when those thoughts come in that shouldn't be there, you say, Lord, you guard against those thoughts. And when you start finding yourself being manipulated and trying to manipulate situations in your life and trying to paint something a certain way when it's not that way to everybody around you, instead of allowing that to go and say, Lord, here's my heart. Here's what I'm doing with it. It's not right. You can handle this a whole lot better than I can. Christian, this morning, your heart needs to be cleansed. And your spirit needs to be renewed. But you can't do it on your own. You'll continue thinking the way you've been thinking. You'll continue to look at things the way you've been looking at them. You'll continue to manipulate and justify sin in your life. And justify things in your life that aren't the way that you're perceiving them to be. If you don't learn to say, Lord... Here's my heart. We sing the song, Here's my heart. Take and seal it for thy courts above. Let's all stand.